Hello, my name is James Walker. I'm a Christian apologist, but even though I'm a Christian, I still learn from Atheist Edge. Both Africanus and Origen cite the work of Thallus and Phlegon from a position of skepticism, not agreement. Africanus said that Thallus proposed an eclipse to explain the darkness to Jesus' crucifixion, but Africanus clearly did not agree with the conclusion. He said that Thallus made the claim without reason. In a similar way, Origen argued that Phlegon was mistaken about many aspects of his account, falling into confusion about some things which refer to Peter. Even as Phlegon reluctantly admitted that Jesus could predict the future. So I, I just wanted to point out here that Wallace has somehow found a way to spin people calling bullshit on his sources as evidence in favor of his argument. It's uncanny. very creative. Uh, uh, I wish I had come up with it myself. Why do you think he even put this in here? Well, what was he, what was his aim? Well, he's, he's trying to say that these are, um, they're, they're arguments from people who are not on his side. Like, he, he quotes Roman scholars who are not Christians. He, he quotes people who are um, I, I always get my the, the Roman names mixed up. He talks about people who were against Christians and how problematic they were and how they didn't worship the Roman gods. So he quotes them as saying, hey, it's not just people, it's not just the supposedly biased gospel writers who are talking about Christ. It's all these other Roman guys who, who had every reason uh, not to support Christ, but they're still uh, talking okay. about him. So corroborating testimony from a hostile witness. Exactly. But these people are so hostile that they're, that they're debunking yeah. the people he's quoting. They dismiss and, and, the claims and, and, of the Christians. they're treating it like, oh, well, they're hostile witnesses, therefore, they're, I, I don't think he understands why, they're, why people, why historians value hostile witnesses. Yeah, they're hostile witnesses, but they're not they would have to corroborate the claims. Exactly. Yeah, and not just here, but in other places, he makes it, he points out that he implies that Christians were the only radical sect in Rome. No, there were dozens, you know, there, it, and there was not just the Christians, there were subsets of Christianity throughout, Rome. you know, throughout the history. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just what, you know, the, the flavor of Christianity that we have today is just the one that won. Yeah, exactly. It, it's history written by the victors because get the, the, the uh, fact that Christianity somehow survived to today does not in any way tell you that it's correct or factual or based on because the Mark the Marcionites the the uh, Gnostics any any one of them could have won out. It's reasonable that people who saw themselves as critical eyewitnesses would be careful to protect the accuracy of their testimony. How do you protect the accuracy of something that you know? Oh my! <sighs> protect the accuracy. That is a really fascinating turn of phrase, protect the accuracy of your testimony. Okay. In the earliest years, their contribution came in the form of verbal testimony. That's reasonable, given the sense of urgency that the apostles felt that they, as they eagerly awaited the imminent return of Jesus. But as the months and years passed without the arrival of Christ, the apostles inked their testimony so their observations could be shared with local church congregations. Okay, first of all, <laughs> what does protect the accuracy of their testimony mean? In the previous excerpt, you said, or he said, that we should take people at their word, and we should say that it's fact, unless there's very explicit justification to do otherwise. This statement seems to indicate that one must be very careful with their memories, otherwise they risk having issues with them when they recount what their memory tells them. Then it just jumps to an assertion that somehow 
they they were protecting them because they knew this. It's inconsistent and it's a little bit frustrating. Uh, regarding the apostles, if they it did exist as depicted, which I doubt that they did, eagerly awaiting the return of the Messiah, I pulled a passage that I think is interesting in this context. It's Matthew 24, 33 through 34, and it says, Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. This is Jesus telling his apostles that he would return to earth before they died. He didn't. So either he lied or there's something else going on here. Like perhaps this story is a work of fiction. I mean, honestly, this guy's an investigator. Oh my goodness. Well, yeah, it's reasonable that the early eyewitnesses would attempt to keep their testimony accurate. But once again, how do you know they succeeded? I mean, you have a faith based entirely on the fact that human beings are imperfect and fallible. They make mistakes. And yet you're trusting that verbal testimony from these imperfect and fallible creatures somehow survive the intervening years between the death of Christ and actually getting put to paper without even a iota, without even a smidgen of change, even if it was unintentional. Let me ask you a question, Chris. Why do you think the apostle the why do you think the apostles were eagerly awaiting the imminent return of Jesus Christ? Because things kind of sucked under Roman rule. What gave them the freedom? impression that he was coming back? Because that's what he said. I Im imminent, like coming back immediately. That's what he said, right? Yeah. Why are the modern apologetics a slippery attempt to back out of that? When you talk about it's going to be on your screen now. I can't. I can't. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't go chapter and verse, but. Um, you shall not taste death until I come back. And there are people uh, standing here who here will today not taste death. who would not taste death. And um, uh, the, uh, this generation shall not pass. And all those. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's. And I've heard all the. I've heard some re some really slippery apologetics on these, but they they. Th is it possible to squirm out of that, or is that pretty a done deal? I've, I've heard varying uh, degrees of credibility uh, in terms of how people rationalize that. Um, I, I think it helps their cause that Jesus doesn't talk like that a whole lot. Like that, I think it's really the only place where he implies the uh, immediacy of his return. So if you can rationalize that one verse away, you, you still have the entire rest of the Gospels to play with. Um, it, it's just not a big theme of his. Like if he if he if he was constantly hammering, come back tomorrow, come back tomorrow, come back tomorrow. Well, saying it twice, I'm um, just probably more, but twice that I can think of is is enough for me. Right. I mean, you mean you, you still got to reckon with those verses? I don't think they always do it well. Christians that adhere to the strict fundamentals of the Bible are called what? Fundamentalists. Yes, and the the. The one, where do you see them on the street with a sam? What does their sandwich board say? The end is near. He, he's coming back now. That's how they perceive it. If you if you read it by the book, fundamental, he's he's coming back now. And every gener in the generation before, they thought the same thing. Were the disciples lying about the resurrection, as Bart Ehrman claims? Were the claims based on religious expectation or bias? If so. What was it that they were hoping to gain from this elaborate lie? This is a very old argument, and it's ridiculous. It assumes that the eyewitness account is actually accurate, or that there is an eyewitness account to draw from. This idea that, oh, based on, you know, if we assume that there was an actual eyewitness, and if we assume that that person was actually accurately quoted that they must have been lying. It's, it's a very old claim. It assumes that they are capable of being accurate, not that they're just willfully lying about it, which is a complete character attack. Sex, money, and power are the motives for all the crimes, all the crimes detectives investigate 
In fact, these three motives are also behind lesser sins as well. This is just categorically false. Crimes are committed in rage, desperation, states of delusion, and psychosis. This guy is really starting to annoy me, actually. People use the gravity of their position to speak with authority to an audience that will take them at their word by virtue of their title are reprobate to me. In my mind, absolutely reprobate. I wonder if misleading people based on your authority is a sin. Okay, so this, this, this is towards the end of the book, and it's the most... There's the most obvious explanation here for the disciples' behavior that Wallace completely fails to account for. He says, he spends this entire chapter saying that, okay, when I'm investigating crimes, it all, the motivations usually, or the motivations pretty much always, go down to sex, money, power, and the disciples were not doing what they were doing for sex, money, power. But... What about religious fervor? That's a big motivating factor. The most obvious motivating factor for what the disciples would have gone for. And he completely just disregards it to try and, and make some, some other case for um, why they wouldn't have been biased. Why they would have had, in fact, every reason not to do what they did. I mean, you brought up Andrea Yates earlier. You know, she didn't do, she didn't commit her crimes. For sex, money, or power. She did what she did out of religious fervor. And I, I don't know why. I, I would think that Wallace, being a Christian, would be very familiar with religious fervor as a motivation. And I, once again, I, I, I want to assume the best of him that he's not deliberately ignoring it because he realizes it. it uh, goes against the point he's trying to make, but he can't possibly just be ignorant of it, mm. right? I, he's not a psychologist, nor am I, nor are you. <clears throat> we do know our, you know our natural... Religions are all over the... They're ubiquitous, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is... It could be... It's arguable, but our natural tendency is to, to believe to, to find meaning in things, we're pattern-seeking mammals, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, there's a thing called, I think it's called the Jerusalem Syndrome. If I'm right, it'll be on your screen right now. But you, you know what this is? You're familiar with it? I, I, I recognize the term. I, I, I think I'm... When you're... It was where people have, like, experiences when they go to Jerusalem. Of, uh, where like they go to Jerusalem really because they're already that way. They're predisposed to it uh, on a higher order level than most mm -hmm. of the rest of us mammals. But yeah, there's a there's a task force of the Jerusalem Police Department. That's that's all they do is they take care of the Jerusalem Syndrome people, the ones that think they have come into contact with Jesus or they are Jesus, and and you know in in this place with all you know they're right there where everything supposedly happened. They feel this sense of awe. They want to be a part of it. A lot of this with the disciples, when he said the disciples were lying about the resurrection, as Bart Ehrman claimed, you know, if if they were there and they were giving their testimonies, I would lean away from them lying. I would lean towards them, just in a in a hyper sense of what, what did you call it? Well, it's religious fervor. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be just that a magical combination of they had the religious fervor thing going on and they had the grief thing going on and maybe that combined to uh, mentally affect them where they were more prone to believe even if they did not actually have a vision themselves that they were more prone to believe others who said they had visions and they, they took that as indication that, oh, I'm actually vindicated in what I believe. This is actually better now. And, they, and that motivated everything else that is attributed to them in terms of, of uh, spreading this new movement and, in fact, dying for their uh, beliefs, ultimately. Hello, ladies and gentlemen in Smiz Mars. I am Mr. Atheist. You might know me from my Thursday show, Dear Mr. Atheist, my Tuesday three-minute rants, or the couple of live shows that I host. If we can overcome our bias against descriptions of the supernatural, the claims of the gospel accounts are convincingly corroborated. Aren't there a great many things we could convince by if we let go of our presuppositions about their impossibility? 
The fact of the matter is, it's not just the supernatural that makes the story of Jesus not convincing. But even if it was, you're asking your audience to get over something to which they can have a very reasonable and very major objection. Perhaps we should all just get over our presupposition that little blue men couldn't be living secretly in our gardens, and then suddenly, the idea of the Smurfs become reasonable. The way you are talking about overcoming bias isn't something anyone should do with any reasonable and skeptical mind. You and those who believe what you believe have the burden of proof. And in this case, we only need you to prove that the idea that supernatural things can occur is a reasonable thing to believe. But you won't because it's not. I hope you'll consider subscribing. And to help seal the deal, I've brought a friend with me. Hello, yes, you absolutely should subscribe to Mr. Atheist. And if you don't, I'll kill you. I mean, this is basically the thesis of the entire book in a nutshell. Uh, Wallace is expecting the reader to reject their own presuppositions while examining the Gospels, while he fails to do the same at his own job as a criminal investigator which supposedly operates by comparable principles and you know through through the entire book he 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 rails against bias against the supernatural but he does not at any point give the skeptic a reason to start considering it he just puts it as a, this, ex this explains everything, but he doesn't give any reason to actually take it as, a, as the explanation. He just expects you to believe him. Yeah, he just says, hi, hi I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Um, I was a crime scene investigator for X number of years. I'm going to, I'm going to look at the Jesus claims exactly as I do a, a homicide detective and I'm going to use as a homicide detective I use the methodological uh, naturalism well that well, that's and so but when I'm looking at Jesus now uh, we're going to throw that out the window even though I just said I'm going to look at it the same way as a crime scene well that that's the whole problem I have with this book is that he does not actually acknowledge that he's using methodological naturalism he is, but, and, and, that, and that's why he, he doesn't bring in supernatural explanations for his cases. And then he takes the resurrection of Christ and he throws methodological naturalism out the window. He treats it like it, it inhibits a honest investigator from finding the truth. If you throw it completely out, if you throw it completely out, what do you, what are you got? What are you left with? You're left with ghosts and specters and aliens and of, fairies. Of and course, yeah. Of course, he doesn't want you to uh, to um, overlook the the possibility of supernatural phenomena because that's all you that's all you have left. And the, the even, okay, even even if you want to ignore all that, even if you want to put supernatural explanations on the table, you when it when it comes to the resurrection, you haven't ruled out all natural explanations. I mean, we have we have the evidence that we have, and I don't think it's enough to say for certain that something supernatural took place. I just don't think we have all the information, nor are we liable to any time soon. So we have to we have to work with the uh, limited information we have available and say, okay, is it something supernatural? Or is it some natural explanation that we can't determine? And he really does not give any good reason to go with one instead of the other. He goes with the undetermined natural explanation in his cold cases, and he goes with a supernatural explanation with the resurrection. And I have not found a rhyme or reason as to why he goes with one or another. And that's just the biggest problem with the book. There's nothing wrong with holding out. For more information there's no there's nothing wrong with okay we got some evidence but we're going to hold out until we find that uh, 357 revolver in the lake mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with holding out for more evidence we just he feels compelled to jump to a conclusion in his line of work if you jump to a conclusion the wrong person goes to jail and you may have someone 
if you're lucky, you find out 20 years later with DNA evidence, but his life is already ruined. You ruin someone's life if you do what he does with the Gospels, with a, mm -hmm. with a criminal investigation. And I, I'm going to say it again. A miracle by its definition is the least possible explanation for any occurrence. That's after you have exhausted every... It goes, it goes simplest, natural explanation, all the way up through the least probable natural explanation, and then miracle. Th th think of it this way. Let's, okay, somewhere, let's say somewhere in North Texas where we're at, there's a murder tonight. Is it possible that I did it? Yes, I am physically capable of killing someone. It's not enough to say that it's possible that I did it and then call it case closed. You actually have to have some evidence to show that I did it. You have to have something that points in my favor. I am not the explanation of last resort. Even if you've ruled out everyone else in North Texas, that doesn't mean that I did it. It could be someone visiting. It could be some random happenstance. There's other explanations at play here. You can't just whittle things down until you, you think you have something. You actually have to have something you can use to convict me in a court of law. Like you have to have my DNA at the scene. You have to have my fingerprints. You have to have a gun registered in my name that matches the ballistics on the bullet. And with God, it's possible God did it. God can do anything. You have to put God at the seat of the crime, so to speak. It's not enough to say that it's possible that God did it, therefore God yep. did it, in lieu of any other explanation. You said a murder is committed in Texas. I was thinking, this is a big state. I could totally discount you. I could totally check you off the list as a suspect if the murder were in, say, El Paso. Because it's you know, here it is about 19:30 at night right now. If he, if, if the person just got murdered in El Paso, he's so. This is a big state. Mm -hmm. There's no way. And this goes back to forensics and physical evidence, because you have a smartphone on you right now, and it is pinging a BTS, a ba a base transceiver station mm -hmm. of a cell phone tower. That right there, they could go look and at your phone. It's on you right now. It's pinging off that tower here in Dallas, Fort Worth. There's no way you could have driven from El Paso in that amount of time. There's good physical evidence that you did not commit that murder. Here's the problem with bringing the supernatural, though. Like if you want to, if you want to posit a god that can do everything, that's fine. But God could poof me from El Paso to Dallas. Mm. Least possible explanation. But I mean, if you want to believe in God, you got to factor that into your investigation. This whole book is just a. The more I think you about it, you can see why I want to I talk totally, about it. Yeah, you're getting me all riled up now. Well, thankfully to our faithful YouTube video, video viewers, now you have another Christian book you don't have to read. <laughs> Yay! We're you, doing all you, the. You just have to take our word for it because we're smart Alex or whatever. because we were eyewitnesses to the reading of that book and said you can believe us because it's not hearsay that we're telling you with our own mouths and we're and we're a hostile witness yeah. well let's see there are too many contributors to this series to name so they are flashing across your screen right now thank you to everyone that contributed um, it was it was an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this and we hope to do it again in the future and please go visit their channels um, all the links to their information their channels their patreons their merchandise it's going to be filling up in the description section of each one of each uh, episode in this series and thank you for watching atheist edge walking the edge of what some consider offensive but your feelings don't matter here. Only facts. Lewis, I want a crab crackle. Edgy commentary on the dangers of doctrine, the foibles of faith, the bullshit of belief, the stupidity of superstition, and the idiocy of indoctrination. Brian, do we have any crab crackles? With razor sharp wit, curiosity, and critical thought, we take an unblinking look at today's religions. Hello, this is Mr. Atheist, and my name is Reasonable Knockoff Stuart Griffith. We are Atheist Edge.